Good afternoon, everyone. We are delighted to have so many of you here today. My name is Fritz Kinlins, and I'm the Senior Director for Berkeley Alumni Affairs. For those of you joining us virtually for the first time today, we welcome you to our alumni webinar series. Today's topic, COVID-19 and the future of live music, is number 19 in our series. It's crazy. It's been, it's been a while. We hope you enjoy today's conversation, and we'll check out our other webinars and workshops online at youtube.com slash Berkeley Alumni. Before we introduce our moderators and esteemed panelists, I wanna run through some general housekeeping uh, for today's event. Today's event is slated to run until 2 p.m. with approximately about 40 minutes of conversation, 30 to 40 minutes of conversation and about 10 to 15 minutes dedicated to the audience Q&A. You can begin submitting your questions via the chat feature located at the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel. Without further ado, I have the extreme pleasure of introducing our trio of moderators for today's conversation. I'll start with Don Gorder. Don is the chair and founder of the Music Business Department at Berkeley. He is an industry expert in copyright and contracts. Tanya Butler is the assistant chair of Music Business and brings over 14 years of experience, um, both as an entertainment attorney and label executive. Tanya is an avid writer and author of the business. Tanya is also delving into the art of podcasting with her newest podcast entitled The Bomb, The Business of Music Boot Camp, podcast coming later this month. My shameless promo, right, Tanya? I'll take it. <laughs> Finally, Jeff Dornfeld is a bit of a legend in the business with over 12 years of teaching experience and over 30 years in the music industry. Jeff has worked with many of the biggest artists of the generation. Jeff was the personal manager of multi-platinum band Boston. Under his management, the band had a number one billboard chart topping album and a $25 million grossing tour. Jeff directed all long-term strategic planning and successfully negotiated multi-million dollar contracts with major corporations in the music and industry and entertainment industry. Prior to managing Boston, Jeff was a tour coordinator, tour accountant, and lighting designer for platinum artist Sammy Hager and performed tour accounting for multi-platinum artist Ozzy Osbourne. As you can imagine, the list goes on and on but in addition to that, and I think it should be mentioned because I am a, a, a nerd at heart, um, Jeff also worked with Schultz Research and Development Manufacturing, um, producing the electronic audio signal processor, Rockman. Um, and he eventually became the vice president of the multi-million dollar corporation. So we are, we this is, this is the biggest uh, set of moderators we've had, and it's really just an incredible group. Um, to be leading this conversation. So um, with that, I wanna pass the mic over to Don to help us introduce our panelists. Don? Okay, well, thanks, Fritz. Uh, what a pleasure to be here with all of you out there in uh, Cyberland joining us. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a great panel assembled for you. Fritz introduced my co-moderators. Uh, what he didn't tell you is that uh, Tanya is uh, joining us. She is... Uh, has been our assistant chair of the department for the last three years. And uh, upon my retirement, which I think most of you probably know, I'm retiring at the end of the summer, and Tanya will be taking the reins of the department beginning in September. So uh, with that in mind, and of course, I, I'm sure most of you know Jeff. Uh, Jeff's been with us in the department for a long time. Uh, so we've got a great panel assembled. They're all alums. Uh, some more recent than others, but uh, all came out of Berkeley and all in, in the industry in one way or another. And I think, you know, you have your, uh, you saw their bios, but I think it would be great just for each of them to introduce themselves and just say a few words about what it is you're doing and what you're involved in, just to give our people out there a sense of, uh, you know, what your role is in this music industry and why you're here on this panel. So let's do ladies first. Megan? Hi, Don. Hi. Um, I graduated from Berkeley in 2015 from the music business program. Um, I started at an agency as an intern there. Um, actually, that was my internship as part of my graduation requirements. Um, was there for about three years, was the booking coordinator there, did a lot of hands-on working with um, pretty much all aspects of the tours from the initial windows to the settlements. Um, and then coming up on two years ago, made the switch over to the management world um, and have been really enjoying doing that. The, 
excuse me, the nature of our, our management firm is that we're involved in pretty much all aspects of their career, the artist's career. So uh, I'm working on anything from touring to publishing to accounting to uh, label administrat uh, administrative services, um, pretty much pretty much anything they need. So yeah, wear a couple different hats. Great, thank you. Okay, Joe. Uh, hi guys, I'm uh, Joe Mott. I finished Berkeley in 2008. Um, I'm currently a uh, agent at Creative Artists Agency based in the LA office. Um, I work with, you know, across all genres on our roster. Um, you know, my responsible clients are heavily in the rock genre. And on top of that, I'm a responsible for our entire contemporary rosters touring on the West Coast, which is everything west of Colorado for uh, arenas, amphitheaters, and casinos. Excellent. And John, our paths have crossed a few times over the years, but uh, uh, tell them about yourself. Absolutely, John. Well, thank, first of all, thank you so much for including me. I really appreciate that. Uh, my, my history with Berkeley is a long one, similar to yours. Um, I, I was an alumni, I am an alumni and, and was in school in the 70s, actually, but I was a trustee for nine years. I'm still on the President's Advisory Council, so I've been involved with the school for, for a very, very long time. Um, I am started as a musician, but uh, what I do now is I'm Senior Vice President of A&R for Columbia Records. Um, I've been at Sony Music, or what was CBS Records and Sony Music for 35 years and always been in the creative side in either marketing or mostly a &R. Um Artists that I've worked with, artists I've signed. Um, my biggest artist is Celine Dion, which I've made her records for 30 years as her producer and executive producer. But I've uh, signed and worked with uh, John Legend, um, uh, uh, Ricky Martin, um, Gloria Stefan, uh, Pearl Jam, uh, just uh, Michael Jackson, just a, a million artists. And I'm um, very fortunate to still make music. I love making music. I love making records. So I'm glad to be here today. Great. Well, you're a great example of a student who did well, or an, an alum of Berkeley who did well in the business, even though you went to Berkeley before there was a business program. Imagine that. So, <laughs> very All right. Well, very a little on the way. In, indeed. All right. Well, let's get right into the discussion. You know, we're here to talk about the live music business. Um, you don't have to uh, go too far to read that the, you know, the pandemic has had a pretty devastating effect on the live music business. Um, it's, uh, and I know most of you out there, our audience are probably, some, many of you are in bands where you felt this, uh, you know, that the, the clubs aren't functioning and, uh, and those in the business side are, uh, you know, your, your business is getting bands into live and and uh it's been a tough time for it well but you know as i told the panelists in advance we're not here to talk about doom and gloom uh yes it has been a troubling time but uh what i think most of you would like to know is uh how are we working through this you know what uh what kinds of uh things are you finding uh that uh, that uh, ways that you can still get bands uh, and bands can still get themselves out and keep their presence known and keep their fan base with them. Those are the kinds of things, you know, that uh, that I'm hoping we can all talk about. So, um, you know, we've, you know, we don't have to list the, the festivals that have been canceled, the the tours that have canceled, the clubs are uh, temporarily cl temporarily closed. But nevertheless, you know, I think one thing that we know is that the will to to enjoy live music is not going to go away you know i mean we're going to get past this and uh and there will be a return to to concerts and clubs and all of that um we just don't know exactly when but uh, i don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind that uh this pandemic the one thing that it is not going to destroy is the will of people to want to, to have live music in their lives. So with that in mind, uh, let's talk about, let me let me throw this to uh, uh, maybe to Joe first, because Joe, you know, you're so closely involved with these bands and getting them out into live uh, settings and so forth. Um, what's going on in your office now that uh, you're, 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 you're working through this and looking for the day when things at least turn back to somewhat normalcy so the tough thing that, that we're facing right now is that 
nobody knows, you know, when this is going to end and it's going to open back up. So everything's just based on speculation right now. So I've, I've got tours that I'm holding three, four sets of dates on in different time periods where once we get the trigger to go, we can go and then put that on sale. So, you know, we're doing a lot of that, um, you know, for example, for Lindsay Buckingham, I'm holding four different, or at one point was holding four different sets and dates um, across various time periods. There's a lot of that. Um, and, you know, I think we're trying to think more creatively about packaging for next year with, with these bands because, um, you know, I think coming out of this, people that went to 10 shows a year might go to four for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. If you went to four, you're going to go to one. Um, so, you know, I think until, you know, the consumer confidence is built back up, we're trying to think about what, what are creative ideas we can, you know, bands that might've been headlining, is there a cool headline package we can put together to, you know, get people more bang for their buck? Um, you know, the real challenge that we're facing right now is that it's really tough to cut a deal for a new tour. Um, when we don't know what the capacity will be, you know, House of Blues Boston, will that now be, a, you know, the capacity just be a thousand moving forward where, you know, you're looking at over 2000 pre pre COVID. Um, so it's, it's really tough to, to make a deal when you don't know what the capacity will be. What will the expenses be? You know, we're, we're going to assume there'll be heavy costs to come in and sanitize this, these venues, both the backstage and, you know, the front house after these shows. So, you know, right now, unfortunately, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. It's, you know, hold dates and then, you know, see where we wind up and then move them again. Um, but, you know, the big thing is coming up with creative packaging ideas. Yep. Okay. Uh, Megan, let me throw it to you. Um, you obviously have artists that you're working with who are saying, you know, we got to get back out there. You know, what, uh, uh, how, how, are, how are things going in your office now with, as you're looking for that day when things start to get better? Yeah, it's, uh, I have clients on, on all ends of that spectrum. Some are, uh, they'd go out tomorrow if, if that were allowed. Um, and some are more hesitant to really get back out there and start touring, um, as heavily as they were pre COVID. Um, we're, uh, it's, it's just kind of a constant conversation of, um, circling back with the agents and with the artists about just how everyone is really feeling about when somewhat regular touring can resume. Um, and like Joe said, the, it's a lot of guessing at this point, unfortunately. So, um, a lot of the same concerns that Joe mentioned are things we're looking at. Um, but I would say more the artist concerns. So, uh, what do those expenses look like? And with the, the nature of what deals will look like, uh, moving forward, how do the artist expense, uh, artist expenses change? Um, if that means the production that we're carrying looks a little bit different, um, if that means the number of crew that we're traveling with for every tour is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, of course, the size of the venue, the, the capacities changing is obviously a big concern. So it is, it's a lot of variables to look at. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming to try and gaze into the crystal ball pretty much is what we're trying to do. But like you said, it's not, you know, people are going to want to see live music. Um, I don't think that really goes away. So uh, we're basically just, we're focusing on how to get all of our clients ducks in a row um, so that when we can resume touring again, that it's in a way that is not only financial, uh, financially possible, but that they're comfortable with it. Yeah, uh, are either of you, Joe or Megan, are you seeing any clubs that are saying, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a season. I, I guess I just read about one uh, Infinity Music Hall in Hartford is, a, is announcing that they're going to be open for concerts sometime later in the fall. Uh, I don't know under what protocols, you know, but I mean, are you are you seeing that in your environments, too? Some of that, at least. I am. Um, there's certain states, Missouri, for example, that has come out and said they're allowing shows. I think um, a lot of stuff in the South is open up to a reduced capacity. Um, you know, one big thing like right now is um, in the casinos, which are on sovereign land, so they don't really have to adhere to government restrictions. So I'm actually booking clients for regular shows um, in the casinos on the West Coast. 
Um, I think the tougher conversation is, okay, you're going to have shows. Um, what does that look like? Do I want my client to be the guinea pig for the first shows back? And, you know, to me, I think unless you really have to do it, I would wait till there's a little more clarity on this. Um, sure, it's nice to, you know, start building up some consumer confidence and be like, yeah, we're waving the flag. Like, we're here to play shows. But at what cost do you want someone catching this at your show? And then, you know, you're the act that decided to jump the gun and there was an outbreak at your show. I don't know if you want that. And then, you know, it's, you know, it just really depends on your financial situation. Honestly, you know, if you were making a hundred K a night, are you really going to go play a reduced capacity at 25% and be willing to walk with 25? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. You know, I want to get into uh, the matter of live streaming uh, as to where that is playing some kind of a role in your business. And, um, you know, maybe I could throw it to Jeff uh, if you want to jump in. You know, uh, most of you know that Jeff is uh, the founder of our Berkeley Popular Music Institute, which is it's a three semester sequence that culminates in the summer with the students taking bands to the major festivals. Well, of course, that didn't happen this summer. But uh, uh, but we Jeff, seven, or they canceled seven. <laughs> yeah. But you found some other ways uh, uh, to, to get these bands out. I mean, uh, so this, you know, just to sort of broach that matter of where are we with live streaming? Is that becoming important? Uh, We've done, we did, well, obviously some live streaming, at home streaming. We're doing some at home and we're doing some recordings also. Uh, but that kind of keeps you, I guess, in front of the audience, but it just definitely does not make up any re revenue losses. I mean, for us, it's not as different, but for an artist to do it, obviously, there are some I know that are doing stuff. Melissa Etheridge, I read, was doing uh, live streaming uh, shows and having, you know, basically merchandise printed up specific for the show. So they, she's selling lots of merch, she's doing something, I guess, that's generating some revenue, but it's never going to make up the difference. I was wondering, uh, Joe or Megan, either of you, I mean, have you thought about that if you're going to go into a venue like Joe, you mentioned House of Blues, that would, you know, cut it down to a thousand. Would you just do like multiple days and to make up the difference? I mean, the cost, I, I get a lot of the costs will still be there, but the thing is that it's one load in, one load out. Same with a lot of other venues. Uh, you cut down, you just stay and, uh, Amortize those costs over more dates and still get this walk out with the same gross. It's just be more dates. And for the artist, it's basically it looks like it would just kind of be an expense of, you know, obviously more hotel rooms, but everything else would be very close to the same. Have you looked at things like that, Joe? Yeah, it's funny. Um, I've been kicking around the idea of, you know, um, basically rather than kind of doing a you know a tour your traditional tour whether it be we'll just use 40 dates um you go out and do that to cut down on costs actually flying people in and just doing mini residencies so you know if, you, if you're selling out two nights in chicago maybe you go do third you know thursday friday saturday sunday in chicago if you're willing to do four in a row then pack it up and then fly to you know where you know the next spot and do so i've been kicking around the idea of just basically going smaller i think everyone should be underplaying next year if you're worth 2500 tickets you should be playing to 1500 if you were selling 1500 you should go play to 500 750 cap rooms but yeah that's something that i've been talking to clients about is basically the idea of mini residencies um where they're kind of hubbed out of one spot and then go do four shows come back go do four shows come back kind of almost similar to the country touring model really yeah yeah, I mean, yeah, because the cost actually on the artist side wouldn't be that much greater. And the cost on the other side, the ancillaries will be still the same. It would just be obviously using up all the dates. And so you won't have enough, you know, dates for all the artists that you potentially could have coming through for a, a season. But uh, it seems like a model that could work if they're going to get into this social distancing at, in the venues. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're going to have to just go smaller and that, and it, you know, you'll play more shows, but, um, you know, people are going to have to cut back on production to cut down costs. You're going to have to cut yeah. back on the crew. Like, you're just really going to have to take a hard look about what is necessary to my touring business and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. 
John, I know that you work with major artists, of course, you know, John Legend and Celine Dion and so forth, but are they, are, are artists at that level, are they getting antsy about this, you know, getting getting out there? Are you having some dialogue with promoters and, uh, and agents uh, uh, as to the time when, you know, we can, when you can get them back out live or are you using um, uh, uh, the, the online, the live streaming and, you know, things like that just to keep their presence out there, maybe to support their next uh, uh, recorded music that they're coming out with? What's going on in your world? I think there's, there's several ways you look at it. Like, I know specifically with Celine, um, you know, the, the promoter, which is AEG, would send them a new schedule basically weekly, trying to figure out, uh, you know, sort of the next leg. Because she had to to postpone the the final leg of her North American tour, and then she had to put her entire European tour on hold. And uh, so they've been since those, the day that they canceled or postponed, they've been working on trying to figure out, you know working with the, country, the countries and what the laws will be, when will the things, places be open for them to actually do shows. And, uh, and they just announced this past week that they're going to start uh, uh, Europe uh, come March of next year. So and they've, everything can change again, depending on what the local laws are. But, uh, but they work very, very closely with the, uh, with the promoters and, uh, and trying to figure out, you know, what's the right thing to do for safety reasons as, as well as, you know, they're certainly all big venues and all uh, in, inside. So, uh, so it's, 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 it's difficult to, 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 to figure out what's right. Um, but I think that at the same time, there's some artists that, that want to do more of the uh, live streaming uh, to mm -hmm. just for awareness purposes, not so much for income. And uh, the, the one thing that, that's really important, there are two, a couple of things that are really important from the live streaming standpoint. Um, first of all, it's, it's, it's making sure that your, that your audio is actually really good quality. Because if you want something, somebody to really enjoy it, make sure that it sounds good. You know, it's, it's early on when people just were starting to do things in their bedrooms. You know, I get it and that, that worked. But I think there's, there's fatigue there. So if you're really going to do something that's going to have an impact, make sure it sounds good. And uh, it doesn't have to have full production, but you just want to make sure the microphones are good and things like that. And also make sure people know, you know, social media is such a big part of what people do nowadays, making sure that people are aware that you're actually going to be doing something, whether it's one performance or whether it's a series of performances, it might be that you're going to set up uh, something where you're going to have different artists that will perform um, via, you know, uh, via the screen. Um, but you want to make sure people know. Because otherwise, it just all sort of falls in deaf ears and it really doesn't accomplish anything. Because the reason you're really doing it um, is outside of your, just your desire to want to get out there and do things, that you want to make sure that, uh, that your audience is, is, uh, is, is there with you. And, right. and what's happening a lot also is you've got a lot of artists that are doing a lot more writing and, and certainly recording in their own home studios. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of, re of recording with other people online gets a little difficult because of latency and, and things like that, but, but it certainly is happening and, uh, and things can be worked around. So, but I think that, you know, there's, there's actually a way to use it, whether it's uh, Instagram Live or, uh, or even what we're trying to do is, is using Twitch and some of these other places where you can do something where there's, a, there's an audience there and you're sort of dropping into that audience there with your music. So, mm hmm G uh, Joe, oh. Megan. Oh yeah, Tanya, please. Oh no, yeah. I wanted to ask. Um, there's a question from uh, one of the uh, observers of the webinar, and it actually goes back to one of my questions. I watched a Netflix special with Dave Chappelle that was outside, um, and it was actually rather small and somewhat intimate. So is there a push to maybe start doing some outdoor concerts or outside the venue, parking lot, you know, anything that will get them back in front of their audiences? Yeah, um, I think a lot of outdoor venues are gonna be the f first to come back on board, just kind of deferring to common sense. You'd rather be outside than you would be inside with, you know, people standing six feet from you. Um, Local municipalities are more willing to play ball in that scenario. As for the parking lot thing, um, you know, there there is a push to do these drive-in shows to me. Um, I think that's a novelty that somebody does once and once only. The economics still makes sense. It's more or less a loss leader for the promoter just to 
create consumer confidence. Um, to me, that situation is the equivalent of trying to fix a gunshot wound with a with a band aid. Um, but uh, there is a push to do that. Um, you know, the Garth Brooks thing is interesting. What he's doing, there's that conglomerate of 300 drive-throughs that he's going to film a professional concert at a sound stage and then you know broadcast that across 300 drive-throughs. Um, so that'll be interesting. But yeah, outdoors is going to be the first to come back on board. Just you know, simply deferring to common sense. You don't want to be standing, you know, indoors and two two inches from somebody. It's definitely more safe outside. Thanks. What about just back back down to the to the indie level? You know, bands that were uh, working clubs. Um, it, it can they? Is there an economics model where they can uh, put on their concerts on their website, you know, for their fans and their fans can contribute to it, uh, pay something? I mean, is that sort of thing going on at that at that level with artists? Yeah, I've, I've been seeing a ton of that and it's something I've been working on for um, a, a few of my clients. Uh, I think initially there was a big push um, as you mentioned, of just kind of like impromptu going live on Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, whatever it may be. Um, and now uh, I'm seeing more of a push towards scheduled events, um, ticketed, uh, virtual tip jars, um, some pre-recorded, some live. Obviously, being able to pre-record something gives you way more control over the audio quality. Uh, you can have transitions, um, and then, but but of course, you're losing the live interaction with the audience aspect in that case. So that's, I mean, talk about a learning opportunity. It's been uh, a complete education to just figure out how do you have some form of a concert um, that you really make it feel like an event uh, and not, you know something that you kind of just logged on and did, which has its place in this. I think the access uh, that fans get to artists right now that they wouldn't normally get is kind of a, a small silver lining maybe. Um, but definitely seeing more of a shift towards ticketed models where you're you're putting it on the website and, and um, cross-posting that to YouTube and Facebook and grabbing people from all different platforms and uh, hopefully getting some tip jar action there. Um, like Jeff said, it's not going to replace your touring revenue. That's It's not possible, unfortunately, but uh, it's something for artists that are really hurting right now. Um, and also I've seen artists use it as a way to raise money for um, charities and foundations. Um, and also for their crew members who are, of course, off the road right now. But of course, for this to work, they're really relying on their fans then uh, to to come forward with the tip into their tip jars and that sort of thing. I mean, if it's going to be worth the time that it uh, that it takes to to do it, am I right? Yeah, yeah, I think, and and it's the technology has caught up so unbelievably quickly. Um, there's several platforms you can use now to record performances even if the band members are in different spaces that's something that I've been dealing with um, where it's just not it's either not possible or it's not safe to have everyone together um, and so getting getting the audio and the visual synced up there um, is possible now which is really exciting and there's really advanced people who can do that now and um, I think the fans really want to help, especially um, now we're seeing some states open up more, but for the eight weeks or so where it was really pretty shut down everywhere, um, people were really looking for, for ways to connect and ways to stay involved with the artists that they care about. And um, I've been seeing a lot of a lot of information showing that the tip jars are actually more effective than the ticketed models. And it's something, some kind of psychological effect there where when you feel like you're donating and it's a voluntary thing, 
um, that people are really willing to help out. And that's been really, really cool to see. But like you said, you need to make it something that people feel is worth their while. And so putting in the extra week or so to get a really solid 45 or 60 minute show with some kind of interactive quality, um, maybe release a new song in there or pull out uh, a song that you don't normally get to do live for whatever reason. Um, so any anything you can do to to give fans something a little extra, it just it definitely helps you out. Yeah, I think well, it's I'm, important also, Don. I think it's important for the young artists to stay in front of their fan base. It's not it's not about. I mean, I, I get the tip jars and all these other things. I mean, they may generate some little revenue, but it's more important to I think to stay in front of them and really put on shows that they'll be interested and they'll keep coming back to even if they're for free because what you're doing is you're investing in your future for for when you do go out and the times will happen i mean there are clubs obviously that are closing down but there'll be new clubs that'll open up i mean things will exist there will be shows and so you got to stay in front so they'll want to come see you and appreciate that you've done all this work with them while things were not happening in the live sector so yeah. i think it's yeah, it's important to figure that you know that one out. How to stay in front of your fan base and how to give that when you're in front of them, you're giving them something they want they want to stay with and view and connect with you, so that they'll also come out and be willing to pay, buy a ticket. You know, whatever six months from now. So, okay. Well, I want to ask all of you this question then: uh, if if we could look to the day when we are past this pandemic and i think that day is when we have a vaccine you know uh uh what is going to be different in your view uh, in other words what have we what ha what has how has this changed the industry uh once we get past it maybe for the better you know what uh, we've learned some things from it uh so uh, you know let's let's I, let me just hear from each of you your thoughts about that let me, let's start with you john I don't know if we've learned anything better. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things, like we haven't shut down in any way. We're still extremely active. Our business is good. Uh, we're still signing a lot of artists. Um, you know, the one thing that we don't have uh, in, our, in, our, um, in our information when we're signing artists, we don't have hard ticket sales. And it's always great to know when you're looking at some artists that are doing what they're doing from a streaming standpoint, you want to know is their engagement. Do, do the fans really care? Do they really want to know about this artist? Is it more than just a song? And certainly when you can see some hard ticket uh, numbers, that helps a lot. So I think that that will be something that we'll get back into and always be looking at. Um, we're not, right now, we're certainly not looking down at artists because that information doesn't exist. We still are very excited about things, signing things that, uh, that we love the music, we love the artists, but we still look for as many ways that we can see the engagement as possible. So that will always be an important part of, of signing an artist because, again, it's not just about a song. We want to find great artists that will be with us for their entire career. Great. Yeah. Joe, what about you? What's, what does uh, CAA look like post-pandemic? Um, you know, in terms of, you know, our specific music department, I think for our clients, we're going to see um, – probably a lot more attention paid to reasonable ticket pricing, um, something that's a little more consumer friendly, at least in the interim. Um, I think that's going to open up, uh, you know, a can of worms in terms of people are going to have to take out less production, things like that, because let's be real, there's going to be reduced guarantees for a while, um, if not door deals on a lot of these places. Um, I think they coming out of this, I think bands that are, you know, willing to bet on themselves and take a, a lower risk guarantee for a promoter are going to come out um, you know, probably financially even better than they had been prior to this, you know, if they bet on themselves and win. Um, but the big thing is, I think, um, I think this is going to le level the playing field for independent promoters, the ones that survive at least. Um, it's no, you know, it's no mystery to anybody that Live Nation's hurting, AT's hurting, you know, those are the big two. But I think if you can survive this, um, it's going to open up a window to really kind of level the, the competition a little bit. Um, and I think that's going to be a healthy thing for this business. Great. Okay. Megan? I think this has been a, a pretty serious wake-up call in terms of how many artists are reliant on touring for their main source of income. Um, and we didn't 
have a chance to plan ahead for this this time. Um, so I, I think moving forward, it's going to be really important, and it's something that you know I've been working on since March, and and will keep working on. Uh, is where else? Where else can you be working? Where else can you be uh, releasing more content? Um, where else can you be more creative and how you're engaging with fans? And this has really forced us to get, uh, think outside the box in terms of what else can we be filling this time with? And, um, you know, we've unfortunately had to learn the lesson that touring can go away, um, temporarily, of course, but, uh, it, you know, it's a big problem when that goes away, even for just a couple months. So, um, looking at, at where else we can be supporting our clients outside of touring uh, more so than we than we were before. Those are great points. Um, uh, and I'd like to hear from the three panelists. Is there any just anything you can say to all of our attendees out there to uh, that might give them hope that uh, we're we're going to set this thing straight eventually and and maybe advice you know on uh, on uh, what they can continue to do. I know I've, I've heard you say a few things already, Megan, but uh, you know, anything just to kind of wrap up that part of it. Um, one thing that I uh, have noticed when talking to clients and also kind of uh, reflected back on myself is um, this kind of heightened awareness around um, obviously physical health, um, but also taking care of yourself under what are obviously incredibly stressful circumstances and some of the habits that have been encouraged, um, whether it's just getting away from your email a little bit more, um, working from home, working remotely can be, uh, cause you to tether yourself a little bit. I'm extremely guilty of that. Um, and just the, just this having having more awareness around supporting yourself and and taking care of yourself and really listening to what you need, um, just being a little extra kind to yourself and others is, um, I think, uh, something that maybe we can take with us moving forward. Hopefully, just some some healthier habits. Um, touring is can be kind of brutal. Um, maybe this. This lets people create a little more space for themselves to do that in a way that is uh, sustainable for them. Great advice. Anything, John? Yeah, I, I got to say, uh, just echoing what Megan just said, um, I think that certainly um, the a tour is 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 mentally stressful. Um, it takes you out of your environment, and it's uh, it can be just really really difficult on your life, your lifestyle. You're physically, uh, mentally, everything. And I think that, you know, I've actually spoken to a couple of uh, managers and, uh, and promoters and agents just about the idea of, of actually having um, some sort of support group that can be brought in to work with tours in the future. And I think that right now it's, you know, it's certainly taken a huge strain on the musician to not be working at all. But I think that, as Megan said, just really taking a step back and and uh, and with your fellow musicians and your fellow everybody that you're working with, the, the lighting crew, the, the sound crew, just really making sure that everybody has that emotional support that they need to get through certainly these difficult times, but also when back on the road, um, just know that, that they need to have that at the same time. So um, I think that that's, that's just something we, we will take out of this. It's This will end. Um, I know that, that just from from our standpoint, studio, studios are opening, so musicians are going to start to be able to work again, just from the standpoint of, uh, of getting the studio and recording. So and I think you're going to see that it's going to broaden a lot um, and really help with just the, the mental aspect of just wanting to get out and play and perform. Um, but just even be able to record is a, is a great thing and very healthy. Very good. Joe, you want to wrap up this part and then we'll go to some questions. Um, I would just add that, look, this is not canceled for forever. Um, and, you know, this is going to come back. It may be a little different. It may take some time to get back to where, you know, we once were, which was looking at like the best year ever in the history of live music, um, which is now gone. But, um, I, you know, it's funny, I'm sitting here looking at the list. My bio is sitting in front of me. I'm looking at the list of tours that I booked last year. And, um, 
and I still really feel um, that the cream rises to the top. And I think just, you know, for people that are starting out with their touring careers, just make great music and the rest will happen. And, you know, this is this is temporary and this business is not going away for forever. So take the time to make some great music and let's go tour it next year. Great advice. OK, all of you. Well, Fritz, uh, we can't see you, but if you want to feed us some questions. Sure thing. Thanks, Don. Um, one question is, is uh, talk a little bit about the little guy. <laughs> what can people with uh, 5,000 less, 5,000 or less followers um, be doing to sort of help develop their business? Uh, it sounds like either Joe or Megan. I think I think what Joe just said still still applies. If you're releasing great music, that 5,000 uh, can expand quickly, and um, people are looking at social media and looking for things to things to do really. So um, uh, being able to release content right now is uh, one of the best things you can be doing. Um, reaching out to your existing fan base, um, word of mouth is always one of the best things you can get. So um, I would say just continuing with me to release music right now is really important. Great. Yeah, I got to echo what you know, also what Joe and Megan said, that, you know, it, it's always about great music and just really focus on making it, making your music that you're doing right now the best it can be. And this is a great time to, to really uh, sort of, uh, you know, get your music out there. So often I hear about people that say, well, I'm waiting. I'm, I didn't, I don't want to put anything out yet. Get your music out there and start doing things online to start connecting the dots. And like I said before, you know, create that, that something that's going to connect people to you and really want to be by your side and want to hear more of what you're doing. Um, and it really, it, it will fan out into all your other businesses by just getting your music out there and, and creating that, uh, that, 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 uh, that connectivity. Good advice. Fritz, another one? Another question, and I, I believe this is coming from the type of musician who you know, has, has made their living completely on touring. So um, do any of you have creative ideas on how to sort of make money uh, when you've been on that touring side of things and now suddenly that's, that's run dry? Even though it is coming back, um, you know, what, what can they be doing in the interim? That is a tough question, isn't it? Pray. No, I'm kidding. Well, I mean, I, I'm wondering if, if they put that question up before Megan was talk, talking about the tip jars and, uh, you know, that sort of thing that's going on. Uh, Megan, I mean, yeah, those are, those are good. It's good, uh, you know, drops in the bucket, but it's not, I, I'm not sure there's really a good, a good replacement for touring um, under these, conditions right now so I patience is is really difficult right now and and one of the things Joe said that really uh, hits home is it really depends on every act's financial situation and and um, some of my clients are not feeling like they want to get out and tour right away but that's a choice that they can make based on their situation um, others are feeling like they need to get back out as soon as they can um, but things like doing um, collaborative live streams are helpful so that you can use uh, some some pull from other artists as well that you're not trying to bring in all of the streams yourself. Um, those can be helpful, which is, I mean, just piggybacking on what Joe said about the packaging for next year. Um, you know, more more bang for people's buck, I think, is a good way to keep your, your online traffic up right now. Uh, but it, I'm not sure I have a good suggestion for, for how to replace touring revenue right now. Okay. Another question, and this may be looking too far into the, the crystal ball, so to speak, but any talk uh, in your spheres around sort of the idea of virtual entertainers, people that are, you know, completely online and they don't, they don't have that physical presence? Hmm. I can speak on our end. That has not come across my desk. Uh, we've seen some really interesting presentations from some companies that have some amazing technology that are 
living specifically in the K-pop space uh, that are doing massive um, productions for virtual events. Um, but in terms of, you know, something that's just online, that has yet to cross my desk. And I forget whether it was John or Megan that said it, but I we actually talked about this in our staff meeting yesterday that there is a live stream fatigue going on right now, um, majorly. And I get a report every day of every client that's doing a live stream and it's north of 100 every time. And um, I think a lot of people are just watching these passively in the background. Um, so I guess interesting idea, but that has not come across my desk. We, we actually had a, uh, at one point, an artist that was completely virtual. Uh, um, did, we didn't know who was doing the music, who was doing the vocal. It was, it was you know, it was, a, it was something that was completely created. Um, and it was very interesting. We didn't sign the artist, no. You didn't sign the virtual artist? We did not, no. No. So I there, just... there was of doing these one of these these uh, um, uh, what's called Pepper's Ghost um, uh, uh, touring situations, um, but that that never came to fruition. It would have been an interesting contract with a, a virtual artist. <laughs> Another question, Fritz? Don, I think that just looking at the time, um, I'm going to turn things back over to you if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe just getting some final thoughts from everyone in the panel. Sure. I have a final thought. Let's wrap right. it up. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I think one of the things artists don't do, I mean, they get really involved in the recording. They spend lots of time, time in there to perfect it. Is I find that artists don't perfect their live shows. I think that's the weakest thing of, of a entry-level artist, that they don't film themselves. They don't look at themselves. They don't study other artist that's gone back you can go all the way back into the 60s and study all those videos and what will apply to your performance and think about reaching your audience and if you're performing and you're not if you're playing in front of a hundred then you're playing next time you're going there and you're still playing in front of a hundred or even less you're not resonating with an audience because they're not telling someone else about it i mean if you're good live People talk about it, and so if you play in front of 100, you're good live. Next time, you should be playing in front of 150 or more. And I think that I don't think artists take it serious. They walk. I've, I've seen artists go into clubs, and they'll just walk from the bar to the stage, and the guitars aren't tune or whatever. They don't go back and sit in the dressing room and prepare themselves. So when they get on stage, they're prepared to start and be a, a great live artist right off the bat. It's no different than a football team coming out from the dressing room. You know, if you start your, your game, you're not ready, the other team scores. Uh, so I think that's a big thing for me. That's always been what I focus on is that live artists have to, the artists have to prepare to play live like they prepare for everything else. It's like they practice their instrument. And I just don't see that happening all the time. Actually, see it very rarely. So. Good. All right. Any final thought, uh, Megan? Um, I I would say what Jeff what Jeff pointed out is as usual, pretty much on the nose. Um, this is a really this is kind of a unique time, and that being off the road right now gives you an extended, uninterrupted time to really be focusing on that kind of thing. Um, understandably, maybe you can't get a group together if you're talking about a band, um, but even just working on what you need to be working on individually, this is a really good time to do that. Um, and the last thing uh, that I would say is, uh, at least within my my sphere, um, we've really been looking and reevaluating how we look at uh, fans' access to the artists, um, and this has been kind of an unusual time in, in the level of access that fans can get. Um, and, and if you are comfortable interacting with them directly, it can be uh, a, a good way to monetize that as an add-on to a live stream or even as a standalone event. Um, but it's something to think about moving forward as well, if it's something that you would continue doing post-COVID um, or you know, new normal with COVID. 
Um, but it's it's something to just keep in mind that if you're an artist who has a fan base that really wants that personal interaction, then things like lessons and virtual meet and greets and um, you know shout out video type things like those can all be happening safely right now and and are a good thing to be taking advantage of. Okay, I'm just going down the line, Joe. You have some final thoughts. Um, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, this is going to pass, um, and everyone should just be focusing on making the best music that they can, and the rest will take care of itself. And what Jeff said is very true. We're in the business of selling live talent. It's really tough to sell that talent if you uh, don't have it together. It's a quick way to wash out real quick and uh, be an afterthought. Um, and I just think this is a great time to focus on making the best music you can and let the cards fall where they fall. Very good. Tanya? Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Megan mentioned earlier. It's really important to maintain both your physical and your emotional health during this time. Uh, you know, a lot of people are su suffering from low level or even extreme depression after being locked in the house, after losing their income. So it's really important to stay strong and to stay healthy. So that's one of the things that I would spend time focusing on. Very good. John? Yeah, I, I would echo what Joe said and Tanya said. Uh, first of all, uh, now's the time to really focus and challenge yourself from a musical standpoint. Make this the best music you've ever made and just keep pushing yourself because this will end and people will be back on the road and, and people are always making music and that's not going to end. So really use this time to really push yourself. But at the same time, you know, show support to all the people that you know in the community. So, because it, it, it is a very stressful time, very, very difficult. And now's the time to reach out to those people to really show that you're there, you're there to listen, you're there to help, you're there, there to support. So uh, just from, from every standpoint, just uh, be, a, be a, a great friend and a great supporter. All great advice. You know, I mean, I really don't have anything to add except that, uh, you know, this the live music is not going to go away. You know, I mean, we're going to get past this. The demand is going to be, if anything, it's going to be pent up demand. People have just been so ready, you know, to get back to a concert, to get back to a club, to a show, you know. Uh, uh, but, you know, we just got to get past this health issue for until we get there. But, you know, uh, we're going to get there. And, you, and you've gotten some great advice from all these panelists. So I think we got it, Fritz. All right. So I want to thank our panelists again for their time and their and their talent. I want to thank our moderators for um, helping guide our conversation. A lot of good things, um, a lot of good ideas and opportunities coming out of this. And um, we want to wish everybody uh, just health and their safety. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the, the hour, uh, this is being recorded. So um, if you know of somebody who would be interested in this conversation, check it out on our YouTube uh, dot com slash Berkeley alumni channel. It'll also be on Facebook starting next week. And uh, from everyone at the Alumni Affairs Office, we wish you the best and we'll see you out on the road.